Uh, today's talk is titled R for Everything. Because I think everyone here knows that I am pretty obsessed with R, right? I think that's, that's a bit of an understatement. And so much so that I never want to leave R. Like, <laughs> why do I ever want to walk away from this magical thing that makes life so great? And unfortunately, my notes stopped syncing. So I'm just going to take one minute to deal with the snafu. So sorry. Hold on. All right, wonderful. Perfect. Now I can actually know what I'm talking to you guys. Right? So when I started learning R in grad school, I didn't really, wasn't much of a programmer at the time. I programmed a little bit in C++, even a little Java, but I wasn't really a, a hardcore programmer. So all the command line tools just didn't really work for me. I wasn't comfortable going to the Bash terminal or the Windows terminal or anywhere and doing that. But R felt like a safe space. I'd be like, hey, anything I do in R, it, it just felt right. And I think a lot of people come up the same way. They don't want to go to the command line, but they feel right in R. So today I'm going to talk about how I try to do every single thing in R and never go to the command line. <laughs> and yes, it is possible. So we're going to show you that all that stuff. And I was just going to show you, hey, look all the cool stuff you can do in R. But then I thought that's kind of boring, so I needed a motivating example. So we're going to talk about football. I was going to talk about hockey, because that is clearly one of my favorite sports. But I don't have any interesting data on that yet. Some people here know that I did some work for an NFL team recently, an NFL football team. And so I have lots of NFL data. I am not going to talk anything about what I did, because they think their secrets are tighter than national security secrets. So instead, I'm going to talk about the New York team, the New York Giants. Giants fans? Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh. All right, so what I have is a bunch of play-by-play -play data. A few years ago, someone managed to scrape CBS News and build this big repository of play-by-play -play data. It's messy. It's like every single play, it's a text description of the play. Really messy to work with. We're gonna do, we'll, that's a subject for another talk. And it is all stored in the cloud. All right, that did not stick at all. If SAR was here, I did that for SAR, who's not here this year. He, he's always obsessed with saying in the cloud. But the data we have is stored as a tar GZ in, on a web server somewhere. Everyone loves tar GZ files, right? So first thing we got to do is create a folder to download them to, right? <coughs> nice and simple, you need somewhere to store them. If you're doing this in bash, you would do make dir, right? In R, it's dir. Well, first I'm checking if it exists, dir.exists. It doesn't, so dir.create creates a directory in R, right? We just saved ourselves a, uh, we saved ourselves a trip to Bash. <laughs> Next up, we need to download the files, right? You could go ahead and use your browser, but do you really want to use your mouse? No, <laughs> right? Do we have any investment bankers here? That's the story about Vinny. You're not, I know you're never a banker, but isn't that the story they take away the mouse from the investment bankers when they, on their first day on the job? That's the myth, yeah. right? Yeah, Gene, yeah. They take away the mouse, so we don't want to use our mouse either. So in R, you use download.file. These names are really quite, they make sense, right? They really try to make it easy for you. The cool thing about this is um, download.file, the first argument is where you're downloading it from. It could be any URI, could be an IP, it could be an IP address, a URL, anything you need. Then you specify the destination file. You say where it's going to go on disk. And then lastly, you specify the method. I'm using curl. You can also use wget. You could use libcurl. You could use internal. Lots of different methods. And it's a really convenient way. You don't need to worry about which method you need to use. Well, you need to worry about which method. But you don't need to worry about the syntax of those methods. And it works on Linux, Mac, and Windows. So you don't have to worry about, oh, does Windows have curl installed? Does Linux have curl installed? You don't have to worry about that stuff. So it makes life a lot easier. And as long as we're talking about OSs here, everyone knows I'm a Windows fanboy. When you use R in Windows, curl just works automatically. You do it on Linux, you need to jump through extra steps. So just saying that on Windows, it just works. <laughs> so now that we have our file downloaded, we need to untar it, right? And nothing has ever gone wrong while untarring. <laughs> and yes, another thing we could do inside of R is download XKCD comics. So pedestrian going to the browser. Who would ever want to go to a web browser when you could just use R? So 
If I want to untar a file, I have to remember a bunch of flags, right? Some of you have this memorized. I bet you Jeff in the back, you know that it's XVFZ, right? Or do you not need the Z, or where's the F going? It's pain in the butt, right? So if you use R, you just say untar. All you need to do, you don't need to remember any flags, and you just untar it so quickly, you give it the name of the tar file and the directory where it's going. You could also tar, so you don't need to remember any of those flags. You can zip and you can unzip. They're all separate functions, making your life a lot easier, so you don't need to remember all this esoteric Linux stuff. So just very quickly check directory, dir, does it exist? And yes, we did, our, did a dir in our directory, and we see we have those two files there. So now that we've extracted these two files, we need to save up space on our disk, right? So let's delete that tar. So the way you delete a file from within R is unlink. We just go ahead and delete that file off of disk, and after I do that, the files are gone. If you wanted to, you could have done file.remove, but unlink just feels so much better, doesn't it? It feels so much more permanent, like you're just like deleting it from the universe. So we deleted these files, we deleted that tar file, we have our other files, I want to inspect them. Well, file.info gives you information such as the size, is it a directory, the mode, when it was created, when it was modified, if it is an exe. So now we can inspect our files, still within R, not going to bash, not using our mouse at all. But of course this is R, so things are vectorized, so we want to do a vector search and get the info on a bunch of files. So I just called directory, which turns a list of file names, and piped it into file.info. But right now, a bunch of guys are thinking, like, uh, does he realize these are all NAs? <laughs> Did anyone else realize they're NAs? <laughs> all right, good. That's because when you call directory, it actually just gives you the file names. It doesn't give you the full path. So if you're not in the current working directory, you, it doesn't know what files you're talking about. Luckily, dir has an extra argument called full.names, and when you pass that, it returns the full path to the file relative to your current directory, and now you can actually access them and use them. So this dir function is really, really uh, helpful, has all these little extra functions to make your life easier, and we'll see some of them later. But I don't like these names pbp2014, pbp2015, I think they're a pain in the butt, so we want to rename them. So logically, we will use file.rename, right? Nice and simple. You say what you're naming from, and we give it a vector of dir, the directory name, and we say give us the full name, so it gives us the full path. Then I give it the two, the two location. In this case, I'm going to use sprintf, and yes, I know it's pronounced sprintf, but I like saying sprintf. And we could have done this more programmatically, but I decided to show, hey, look, we could use sprintf to do some text manipulation, another thing we could do very quickly in R. So we'll just use dir to check, hey, it came through, and it looks like it's working. But now, we renamed it. What if I want to make a backup? Because I know I'm going to screw it up, and we always, it's always good to have a backup. So for that, we're going to do a copy, which is file.copy. Notice the theme here, how easy this is? In fact, if you're using RStudio, you just type in file, tab. You don't even need to do tab anymore. You just pause for 250 milliseconds, and it'll autocomplete for you, and it'll give you a list of everything, and you can find all of these functions. Thank you, JJ. So here we created a new directory, and then we copy the files from the old place to the new location, again using the same syntax as file.rename. Just to make sure they exist, I do another dir, but this time I say recursive equals true. This allows us to go, if there's directories, it searches inside the directories and gives us the full paths to those files. You could also use list.files, but that sounds like a lot more typing, so use dir. So now we have our files, we have our backups, we know they exist, so we want to get a little more information about the files themselves. Like for instance, we know these are CSVs, so maybe we want to figure out how many columns are in there, all right? Because sometimes when you load it up into using read.table, you need to be careful. So count.fields, pass it a file name, and this will tell you how many, row, how many columns are in each row of the file. Now what's cool about this is, we can see in the very first file, we have 45 columns, 45 columns, 45, 
until we get to 15. <laughs> Something's messed up. The second file, there is 45, there's 15, there's NA. So if you try using read.table, this will screw up. So right away we know we need to use read.csv2. Or if you're in the Hadleyverse, read underscore CSV2. All right, so right away they let us know that. Another thing you might want to know is how many rows of data are in the file? Unfortunately, I could not find a function in R to do this. But luckily, R gives us a way to drop down to the terminal, to the shell, and run a shell command. So while still in the safety of R, <laughs> I call the system function, which lets me write any command I want, by the way, including rm-rf slash. So you want to wipe out someone's entire hard drive, you can. Please don't do it to anyone you like. But right here, we're using the word count program from the bash terminal, and bash shell, I should say, and passing the dash l flag. This gives you a line count. So for both of our files now, we get a line count, and that is saved, at, and that prints out an R, and you can save it as an R variable, so you could use it later in a program if you want. And this works in Windows? Yes. Wow. Right? <laughs> That's amazing, and it's going to get even better now that there's Bash on Windows. Hey, Microsoft, thank you for Bash on Windows. That's going to be really great. No, that's awesome, guys. That's awesome. I'm a Windows fanboy, so I love it. But it works on Windows, works on Mac, works on Linux. It's really amazing what you can do, because R makes things so interoperable. So now that we have our files, you have to deal with relative paths all the time, right? You have to worry about you know, where directory you're in, what you're going to. When you're writing a markdown file, that can be a pain in the butt, because you're working in your home directory. When you run the file, the working directory becomes that file's working directory. So it's hard to do it interactive and programmatic at the same time. So to do that, we will use file.path. This allows you to take a directory, which maybe you saved as a variable, and maybe as an if statement, so depending how you're using it, and reference to the full path of the file. Some of you might be saying, well, shouldn't we just use paste to paste it together? No. Because file.path is faster than paste, which I know how fast can you get, you're putting together strings, but it is faster. But more importantly, it handles the forward slash and the backslash for you. So if you're on Windows, you use backslash. You're on Linux or Mac, you use forward slash. It does it all automatically. So now we have our files. We have all this information. It's time to read the files into R. So we're going to use directory. Going to say, give me the full names, and search for a specific pattern. I only want to find .csv files. So I'm giving you this pattern. It won't find any files that don't end in .csv. And of course, we're doing this the new fashion way. We're going to use Hadley's pure R package. Which, by the way, some, uh, no, I'll save that tidbit for later. Someone here had a big influence on that name. I'll tell you who later. Um, and we use directory. It's a vector of late names. We're going to loop over it using mapdf and reduce it to a data frame. So everyone thank Hadley for making that so helpful. Actually, I'll give the spoiler now. Ha uh, Hillary, you're here, right? Hillary helped come up with the name Pure R for Hadley. So thank you for that. So we have our data. Let's go ahead and see the data. I'm running out of time, so I will speed this up a little bit. Even though it's my conference, I can just make you sit here and skip lunch. <laughs> but I like eating, too. So we're going to use the DT package to go ahead and load this up in a JavaScript table. And we see this beautiful, scrollable, searchable, sortable table right here in our Markdown document. So it's very simple. I know JJ touched on it earlier. Right now, the only thing is, if you're printing to PDF, you can't use these things yet. But JJ has promised me a fix for that soon. <laughs> as long as I can see them, I'm cool. That'll make my editor very happy. All right, so Deborah's going to be happy. So th thank you, JJ. All right, so we're going to use this data now. We're going to, again, talk about the Giants. I want to see the probability that they're going to pass the ball versus rushing the ball. And this changed dramatically when Eli became quarterback and won two Super Bowl MVPs. So we're going to focus on just the one team's offense. Just the Giants, just when they're passing or rushing. So no defense. No punting, no kickoffs, none of that stuff. We're going to use dplyr, which I gave away some dplyr stickers earlier, guys. And you're going to use that to filter it and to mutate it, make sure things are a factor. Right? Again, we haven't left R yet, right? Now, of course, at this point, we're not going to leave for a little bit. Next up, we've got to fit a model. We want to fit a binary regression. So we all know what function to use for that. That's very simple. 
GLM. Wow, come on, guys. Or big GLM, if you're using big memory package. Or RxGLM, there's lots of GLMs. All right, so we're going to fit the model using one line of R code to do GLM, pass it the formula, and we're going to plot a coefficient plot. These coefficient plots are an idea I completely ripped off of Andy Gelman, who will be here later today, giving the keynote. And basically, it shows you the probability of a pass given any particular down, accounting for the yards left to gain. So this tells us exactly what, exactly what we think, that on third down, you're much more likely to pass, especially if you have a lot of the yards to go. The thing you might notice is on fourth down, is a very wide confidence interval. That's because there's not a lot of data for fourth down, so we don't really have a good estimate for what they're going to do. So this coefficient plot is nice and all, and you can tell what's happening, but imagine if you're a coach on the sidelines, you have to sit here and interpret this. No. So what you want to do, we're going to create a scenario. We're going to come up with every single possible down, first through fourth downs, and every combination of one through 15 yards. So first and one, first and two, first and three, second and one, second and two, so forth and so on and make a nice graph that shows this. We're using some old stuff in R using expand.grid and predict, and some new stuff using mutate. We pump out a table like this, which tells you for a given down in yards to go, the probability of a pass and an upper and lower bound. But this is still not useful in the middle of a game situation. You have 30 seconds to call a play. So everyone knows you want to visualize this, which we use ggplot for. And now you can laminate this and hand this to a coach and have them look at this and be like, all right, it's third down and eight. The Giants have an 82% chance of passing. It just influences their decision that much more. So it's just a really helpful way to do it. Now, we're going to put this graph aside for a second, come back to it. I literally have two and a half minutes. We'll make this happen. Let's say we want to go download Eli's stats from Pro Football Reference. You want to scrape the web. Forget Beautiful Soup, you can use Rvest, which is faster than Beautiful Soup now. So, that's awesome. We're going to use Rvest to read the HTML, parse out the nodes, and extract the table. And you can go ahead and extract any arbitrary CSS selector or XPath and get it out. But we just extracted this Eli's career stats just to have it. The next step, now that we have this file, and we have this image, we want to save them. How many years until this becomes anachronistic? <laughs> right? So my nephew is not going to know what this is. So let's save them to disk. We are going to use create a new directory, gg save to save the last plot, and write.table to write the CSV. Never use row names equals true when you're writing to a CSV. It just screws up the formatting, and only bad people do that. But now let's say you want to commit this to Git, right? For some reason, you want to commit your finished products. I know that's controversial. But let's say you want to do that. We're not going to go to the command line, right? We're going to use the package git to r. We're going to specify our repo, which is our current working directory. We're going to add our files to the repo, commit them with a good message, by the way, and then push them. Again, we just went through our work process. We just pushed to Git without ever having to leave r. You could use the Git interface in R Studio, which is amazing, but do it from R. So now you have your files, you save them, you have committed them. Let's email them, right? You want to send an email? Use the Gmail R package. <laughs> you build a MIME object. You say who it's going to, who it's from, the subject, the body, and you can attach files. And then you just send a message, and you send an email. All from within R. You never have to open up that interface. And there are similar packages for Facebook and LinkedIn. <laughs> so things we've done, we've created directories. I'm not going to read these all off. We've done all this great stuff all inside of R without ever having to leave the safe confines, without ever having to, leave, without ever having to use our mouse. We've done all of that in the beautiful land that is R. So thank you. <laughs>